Hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Borough President Jim Otto's Lyme Disease Awareness Forum. I'm sorry for the abrupt beginning, but we do want to start on time, even as people are filtering in. I'm Deputy Borough President Ed Burke, a uh, graduate of Wagner College, by the way. Thank you, Wagner College, for hosting today. So while folks are signing in and getting settled, I thought I would just open it up by saying I myself was treated for Lyme disease. And what's really frustrating me and makes me angry is I love parks and nature for my whole life. It's been big, a big part of my life for my whole life. So it's a double whammy. Not only do you have these horrible health impacts from Lyme, but it shuts you out from the natural world. I am afraid to leave the trail now when I go on parks. Um, so I'm so glad that Borough President Otto is in the forefront of this and that this is his second forum. I can't help but chuckle at myself. Here I am in our parks. Here I am loving our parks. Here I am with a tick. That picture is actually taken last April, a black-legged tick. And because of the awareness that the Borough President's forum, uh, forums have given me, I knew exactly what to do, get the tweezer and uh, remove it. There was old urban legends about you remove a tick by putting nail polish remover on it, or by putting uh, lighter fluid on it, or by lighting a match to the tick. None of those work, but especially if you do them all together, then they really don't work. <laughs> I'm glad there's so many people here because, pardon the pun, but this is a grassroots campaign to raise awareness about ticks. Because if we don't, then many more people will encounter the ticks and get infected. You see this photo? Uh, my remarks are really brief. But the borough president knows because he's been asking Staten Islanders to get out in the parks. He's been asking young people to get out there and exercise. And as we're doing that, we've got to raise awareness about Lyme. Can you imagine uh, asking an eight-year-old kid not to chase the ball into the high grass? It's just, uh, it's just crazy. So our dilemma is dealing with these two villains in the piece, the bacterium itself and the black-legged tick. Um, so we're glad that we have some excellent presenters here, the Department of Health, Columbia University, Manhattanville College, all have terrific speakers here doing amazing research. I want to thank and recognize a local doctor who has always been available to answer questions, who's always been available to help people. He's been at all our forums online because he cares about this issue deeply. Dr. Ernest Visconti, would you raise your hand there, Dr. Visconti? We have one of Staten Island's wonderful high schools with their students who wanted very much to raise awareness about Lyme, and so they have a whole table out there for you. So we have to go and support them. And that is Gaina McGowan Expeditionary School. When students get involved, the borough president is really proud because that's mentoring. It means they're listening and it means they're learning. <laughs> and finally, are there any physician's assistant students in the house? Holy mackerel! That's good, because we're going to need you in the future, so pay attention. And um, I think I just one more thing to say. Um, I don't know if this is going to be alluded to later, but a lot of the attention on Lyme locally would not have been possible without the borough president because of his loud voice on this issue. And very recently, the state uh, installed these in some of our state lands on Staten Island. These are called four posters. The deer comes and feeds on some corn as it bends down insecticide on these washes kills the ticks on the deer's head, doesn't harm the deer, and this gets repeated over and over. Same with some apparatuses for mice. Uh, the city of New York is also doing this. This is the level of specificity that we're all trying to get into to deal with this issue. And again, circling back to I care about my health and I care about nature and enjoying the outdoors, so I really i am so delighted that you're all here and I applaud you for coming to this. And I guess that's the best entree to introduce the borough president himself and thank him for having this forum. Borough President Jim Otto. Uh, for those of you who um, are unfamiliar with the work that Borough Hall is doing, I strongly encourage you to follow us on social media. There is the official Borough Hall Twitter page and Facebook page but you really want to follow mine because I am far more entertaining. But we cover a lot of this. Um, I want to thank uh, Eddie Burke. Uh, he is the conscience of Borough Hall, and he has been 
long before I got there. He's worked for three borough presidents, and you're not going to find a better human being than Eddie Burke. And Eddie leads with his heart, and Eddie has led with his heart on this issue, and it really is the reason why I have come to know the little that I know about it, but come to be uh, as concerned and as moved uh, by this issue as I am. This is not something that happens to people in a little town in New England. Uh, not anymore. Uh, this is happening across Staten Island. It's happening across the country. If you look at the map where Lyme was to where the map is today, it's uh, spread out. Why that is, uh, maybe it's uh, climate change. Um, I don't know, but I do know it's real and it's on Staten Island. Um, we can argue, and believe me, we have, the role that deer play, how big of a variable they are, or the mice bigger uh, in the equation than the deer, how much do the deer play. It's coincidental that there's much, there are many more deer on Staten Island and the anecdotally the stories of Lyme has increased. Maybe that's because, as I said earlier, with climate change, everything is, is increasing. It's just coincidental. Maybe it's not. Um, I do know that uh, one thing that's not um, disputable is that those deer are absolutely devastating the ecology. And when you're one quarter green and you're no, known as the borough of parks, that is a problem. But that is a discussion for another day. Uh, I want to show you a cartoon. I, I won't say this is me, but it is damn sure close. Your paranoia of Lyme disease is ridiculous, and he looks like he's about to fight the mountain in Game of Thrones. Um, but, but that's um, both professionally and personally where I'm at. And again, a lot of it's through the work of Eddie and the team at Borough Hall. A lot of it is from reading. A lot of it is from talking to Staten Islanders. Uh, Ed mentioned Joe Romagnolo. I didn't see Joe, if Joe's here or not. Um, some of the stories that I have heard from Staten Islanders about what they are enduring or what their children are enduring from Lyme disease have been enlightening, uh, unnerving. It's not like, uh, for some cases, it's not, well, you take a few um, doses of doxy or something and, and uh, everything is good. For some people it is. For some, it is much more of a challenge. I happen to be an absolutely huge uh, baseball fan. As you can see from the dark circles under my eyes, I'm a Met fan, sadly. <laughs> um, but Tom Seaver, the greatest Met of all time, has his vineyards in California and announced several years ago that he had Lyme disease and he had an absolutely debilitating, has an absolutely debilitating case of it. Um, and as a dog owner, my wife and I have two pugs. Um, I'm really conscious of it. Those trips to the winery, the vineyards in, in Ulster County, Roba Barrow, I highly suggest it. Um, take on a little bit of a different feel with the two dogs during May and June and July. Um, this is a real issue. And if you follow us on social media, you see how much time we spend on it. Uh, the trips to Dutchess County to the Cary Institute to, to meet Dr. Osfeld. Eddie has me in Essex County meeting a bunch of folks who are culling deer and why, you know, why can't we do it here? The, the, the mouse car wash that Eddie alluded to, the four poster. Um, we, we live and breathe this issue uh, because we know that it's impacting Staten Islanders and it's a hell of a trip for some and I, wa I don't want uh, folks to um, go down that road. I will close with this. We live in the most hyper, well, I shouldn't say the most, we live in a hyper-partisan era. We live in an era where there's access to more information than ever before, but people take less advantage of that than they should. They read a Google page or two, and now their opinion, which is really based in emotion, is equivalent to the best, um, you know. And so as I get older in life, I gravitate more and more to science because everybody's got an opinion and I'm looking for a life raft in science. And so I find myself watching these documentaries. Um, Mark, Dr. Mark Hyman, who is a functional physician, did Broken Brain 2, nine part series. I recommend it. That led me to something called Interconnected where I'm learning about the microbiome. 
uh, nine-part series, fascinating. That led me to something called remedy, something around something, something about herbal medicine. I don't know if I can extract truth or if it's one big, long, elaborate infomercial. But I did find out about this book, um, Healing Lyme, Stephen Harrod Buner, Natural Healing of Lyme, blah, 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 blah. I don't know if it's any good. I haven't read it yet. We just got this. We got a bunch of them. We are making them available to you on the, on the way out. So listen to the experts in the room. If you want to try to take a more of an uh, herbal shot at it, I'm going to read it. I'm going to see if I buy into it or not. I'm a sucker still. I, I went through every grow your hair back tonic there was. <laughs> and here I am still buying from infomercials. But I'm, I'm, I'm in a search for truth. I think you're going to hear a lot of truth tonight for some really astute people. Eddie and the team have done a fabulous job of bringing together a, 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 a really learned group. Um, and so I've, I've spoken um, far too long, but uh, I want to thank all of you again for being here. I think we're going to hopefully learn a lot and hopefully uh, be a little bit more educated as we uh, head out of here tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, can we have the Department of Health team, please? Sally has been with us also, like this, Dr. Visconti, at every line forum we have here. So we're really appreciative to the Department of Health for their ongoing commitment on this issue. And we look forward to what you have to present. Dr. Sally Silvinsky. So one, thank you so much um, for inviting me. Again, this is my third time being here. And I agree it's because of your dedication and devotion to your constituents that this is happening um, and creating awareness and um, bringing about things happening on Staten Island. So thank you very much. So um, I am with the Department of Health. We're going to take a quick tour through human surveillance data. Um, we look at case counts and monitor trends over time for tick-borne diseases uh, in New York City. So we are quick going to go through and there's going to be time for Q&A after so if you do have questions or uh, want to get more into the, the details about some of the things I present we can do that later. Um, so just so you know in terms of how we know about case counts there's certain diseases that are reportable to the health department so doctors laboratories have to report these cases to us and that's how we get information to then further investigate and determine if it's uh, a case or not. So this provides a list of all the different tick-borne diseases that have to be reported to the health department. The vast majority of the investigations we start are based on positive lab reports that we get from a, a diagnostic laboratory. Um, surveillance really is about capturing trends. We want to see what is happening over time. Um, it's not so much about getting every single case, but again, just looking to see what we're seeing over time. So we're going to start with Lyme disease. I'm going to touch on a few other uh, tick-borne diseases. But uh, for Lyme disease, uh, this is a disease that probably some of you are very familiar with. Um, essentially, it starts with most people, fever, uh, nonspecific illness, um, swollen lymph nodes, headache, fatigue. Uh, some people uh, have a, what we call an erythema migrans le lesion, or an EM lesion, or an EM rash, which is essentially where the spirochetes, that spirochete bacteria, are getting in under the skin and migrating outwards. Um, that itself is diagnostic for Lyme disease. You don't have to do any further testing, and a doctor can treat when they see that. Uh, if the spirochetes start to disseminate, you can start to see other um, things happening in the body, more dissemination. It can cause um, some rheumatological problems, arthritic complications, uh, rarely cardiac complications, um, sometimes neurologic manifestations, most notably Bell's palsy. Um, and the further it goes on, the more severe these can be. So this is just showing you over time Lyme disease cases for all of New York City. So you can see the general trend is we are seeing an increase in cases. And then you can see in 2018, we actually saw a drop in cases. And this is showing you for all of, the, all of New York City, it's broken down by boroughs. So what we're looking at is, and I can't see it all that well, but um, what we're looking at, you can see most of the cases uh, are from people in Manhattan, followed by Brooklyn. And then you can see towards later years, we're seeing an increase in uh, Queens and Staten Island. 
So that's total cases. So you can see most of our cases are Manhattanites and Brooklynites. But when we look at rates, so we're comparing populations, right? We want to look side by side. What is the rate for Manhattan versus Brooklyn versus Staten Island? You can see that green line. It was Manhattan for the longest time. And then all of a sudden, we see Staten Island. You guys are ahead. Um, you're beating Manhattanites. That's not a good thing. <laughs> um, but you can see, again, the, the uh, rates went down in 2018 across all boroughs. It wasn't just Staten Island. And one thing I will say, you know, this was something that we saw when we saw the decrease in, in, in total case counts. This was something that we saw in our regional partners, too. So there was something going on, at, and we had a decrease in uh, tick counts as well. So, um, you know, we would like to say it was awareness and whatnot, but probably there was something going on that decreased the number of infectious ticks that were out there. Um, okay, so this, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a special study that we put together at the health department. So years ago, we wanted to figure out, um, well, we did know most of our Manhattan cases, pretty much all of our Manhattan cases, were getting their infections outside of New York City. If you were to look at a map, you would see clusters of people in Manhattan um, in some of the wealthier neighborhoods. And these were people that were leaving the city for the, for the summer, getting infected, coming home, and getting diagnosed. So no indication that there was Lyme disease transmission in, in Manhattan with all of these cases. Um, but we wanted to look at Staten Island and some of the other boroughs. So what we did was, again, this special study where we took a subset of the Lyme disease cases that were reported. And those people that had an EM we asked them about travel. We wanted to know, leading up to your rash, in the 30 days leading up to your rash, did you leave Staten Island? And so we were looking at that data, and the people who said no and didn't report going to a known endemic area in the surrounding uh, parts of the, uh, the area surrounding New York City, that was to us a locally acquired case and showed evidence that there was local transmission going on in parts of the city. And so what we saw, this is Staten Island. So for all the cases that we were interviewing over time, even last year when the numbers went down, the proportion of people who are getting Lyme on Staten Island out of all the cases that are getting diagnosed, we're seeing more and more that are locally acquired versus potentially travel associated. Um, so for everybody that we interview, and again, most of this data is being driven by the people from Manhattan and Brooklyn, these are the areas that people go where we think they're probably getting infected outside of the city. A lot of people going up to the Catskills, Hudson Valley area, uh, surrounding states, and Long Island. Um, and this is, this is kind of looking at the data just by, but, but looking at it through maps. So this is taking three separate maps with three different time periods. So the first map is 2006 to 2010, second map is 2011 to 2015, and the third map is 2016 to, to last year. And so what it's really showing is, does this, oh yeah, it works, okay, great. So you can see year, year, these time periods, uh, over each of these time periods we see a lot of cases in Manhattan and Brooklyn, but you can see over time the increasing case counts uh, that we see on Staten Island. And then this is a map just looking at Staten Island. So the same time periods, but what we're looking at is total case counts, and then we're overlaying it with the number of people who are acquiring Lyme disease on Staten Island. So again, just over time, what we're seeing is an increasing number of cases and an increasing number of people who are getting uh, Lyme disease on Staten Island. Um, and then just kind of some, some basic demographic information. So when we look at the profile of people who are getting diagnosed with Staten Island, predominantly white, and then we see uh, uh, bimodal peaks with the age count. So we're seeing a lot in, in kids and then in older adults. So Lyme, but there's a lot of other tick-borne diseases, so we're quickly going to touch on a few other diseases. So we're going to go, we're going to go over anaplasmosis and ehrlichiosis. So these are very similar um, in terms of presentation, but transmitted by two different ticks. So anaplasmosis, uh, the black-legged tick, just like with Lyme disease, and ehrlichiosis, transmitted by the lone star tick, which is easy to recognize because of that nice white dot on its Sputum. But these people tend to present with, again, we're talking about tick-borne illnesses, very nonspecific. People tend to present with a fever, chills, headache, very nonspecific, uh, sometimes cough, arthralgia, rash, not that common. Maybe you see it more with um, uh, ehrlichiosis with kids. 
Um, and severity is really linked to immune status. So we tend to see more cases in older folks and folks who are immunocompromised. And this is just looking at case counts over time. Um, so again, trend is up, but similar to like we saw with Lyme disease, we saw a decrease last year in case counts. And then looking at uh, by borough, most of our cases are among Manhattanites, um, but we do see, uh, where's, there's blue Staten Island. We do see Staten Island, and we have seen local transmission of this on Staten Island. And then ehrlichiosis, not as many cases of ehrlichiosis, um, but still kind of going up in the last few years. Um, and looking at who's getting it, it's mostly among Manhattanites as well, people who are leaving the city and getting infected and coming back. Um, and then Babesiosis, another one. So this is not a bacteria. This is a, um, a protozoan parasite. So it's kind of similar to malaria. It infects red blood cells, can cause a, an anemia, causes severe fatigue, um, weakness, sometimes night sweats, abdominal pain. Um, most people who are infected, uh, their body readily clears it. Uh, you don't even know you were infected. Um, but folks who have had their spleen removed, who are older, immunocompromised, those are the folks that tend to get sick. Um, and uh, I think that's all I wanted to say about that one. And then looking at case counts over time, you can see with this one also increasing numbers, a little bit of a drop last year. This is also transmitted by the black-legged tick like anaplasmosis and Lyme disease. And then looking at who's getting it, Again, mostly folks from Manhattan, but we are definitely seeing an increase in um, Staten Islanders and definitely seeing an increase in local transmission of this disease on Staten Island. Uh, so Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, um, pretty nasty disease. Fortunately, we really don't see a lot of this. This is spread by um, the American dog tick, Dermacenter variabilis. Um, this one can be pretty nasty, but again, we just don't see a lot of this one. And then that's looking at case counts over time, so just not a lot of it, and not, not that much in Staten Island. Um, so we try to do outreach and education. We, we tailor our education towards both the provider community and then the public. Um, so this is some materials that we've put together for providers. It's a, a manual. It has information about all the different diseases, how to recognize, how to diagnose, how to treat. Um, we put out a, an alert at the beginning of each season for providers, giving them information about uh, surveillance findings from the previous years in humans as well as tick surveillance information. Uh, and for the public, um, we've tried to do a lot of uh, focusing our education to kids, uh, trying to encourage them to learn and adopt behaviors at a young age that they'll carry with them through life. So we put together, um, many of you may have seen this already, our All About Ticks workbook. Um, we brought plenty of copies that you can take home. You can order them from the health department. It's got a lot of fun games and activities, including the very fun try and find um, the, uh, the nymphs on the uh, poppy seed bagel, and um, go to a lot of health fairs where we bring a lot of uh, materials, try to encourage people to come talk to us. Um, we hire students during the summer, and we have uh, presentations that we advertise that we can make available through day camps, um, overnight camps, um, different groups, libraries, um, and invite the kids to participate and uh, inter interact with our Tick Check Harry. These are stuffed dogs that we've used Velcro to attach ticks to, so they spend time trying to find the ticks and remove the ticks properly. Um, they, that's usually the hit of the presentation. Oh, there's our poppy seed bagels. Um, and we just finished putting together a tick ID card. We also have these. These are wallet size, so you can carry it around, put it in your wallet. Helps you identify ticks uh, in the field and all kinds of good information about protecting yourself and protecting your pet. Um, Getting back to the pets, great information that's available. I would urge you to talk to your veterinarian about what's the most appropriate uh, preventive measures for your pet um, and even uh, the possibility of uh, doing diagnostic workups and appropriate treatment if it comes to that. Um, there's a great resource on the Tick Encounter website that gives information about the various tick preventive um, uh, medications or preventive uh, materials that are out there. Uh, but again, definitely talk to your veterinarian because not everything is appropriate for every pet. 
Um, and then we're just finishing up our uh, yard brochure to give some useful information for Staten Islanders about what they can do through landscaping and potentially uh, pesticide application to reduce the number of ticks in their yard. Uh, and we just did this great, fun um, social media campaign that's out and highlights Staten Island in it as well. So hopefully you'll see that. And that's it. We'll hand it over. Um, okay, so uh, talking about ticks, uh, which is my job uh, right now. Um, so some facts. Are ticks insects? No, they're not. Um, they're actually arachnids um, related more to spiders, spiders and scorpions, that sort of thing. So the, um, the real young ones, um, do have six legs, um, but the, the teenage one, the nymphs and the adults, uh, if you see something really small crawling on your pant leg or your boot that looks like a little tiny spider, it's not a spider, it's a tick if you're walking around the woods. Um, can, can ticks, uh, how do you think ticks get to um, your hairline or on top of your head? Can they fly? Can they jump on you? What do you think? No, they don't, they don't fly, they don't jump. They, they do something called questing. And you can see a picture here. Uh, that's, a, um, that's a black leg of ticks with his arms outstretched on a, on a bud waiting for um, you to walk by um, so he could grab onto your um, pants. Um, but they, they, they start out on wherever they can grab on, onto, and then they'll crawl. They'll crawl, and they'll look for a suitable spot to um, embed in your skin but they don't fly, they don't jump on you. Um, what do ticks eat? They eat you. Um, so, I mean, it's very important. Um, there, are, there are four uh, stages, the four stages there, egg, larva, nymph, adult, uh, except for the egg, all the, the other three stages eat, uh, require blood. If they don't get blood from a host, uh, they die. And um, what's interesting about ticks is they have a, a three-year lifespan, and many of them require different hosts at, at each of those different life stages. So they have a very complex uh, lifestyle, lifestyle and life cycle. Um, and um, it makes them hard to study, hard to control. Um, and um, we could show you, uh, this is a black-legged tick, and I like this picture because the mouth is the, um, that harpoon-looking thing that's what embeds into your skin that holds, holds it so tight onto your uh, skin. And I like this picture because it shows um, the different life stages through the different seasons through, as you go travel that spiral, um, you know, and it takes, again, about three years to go from eggs, which is sort of at the center, um, out through the, you know, the summer and into the fall, and then by the time the fall comes around, they're adults at that point. Um, and what's important about this picture is, you know, spring and summer, if you notice, that's when you're seeing adults and, and the um, nymphs are the kind of the, uh, the teenager, teenage of the version of the tick. That's when you see the most pl plentiful ticks. So that's when you really have to kind of watch out. Um, it, when you're walking around in, in natural areas. Um, and, and, and where are ticks found? Somewhere, right? Somewhere, somewhere in, 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 um, in natural areas, woods, for instance, but uh, what we call um, edge, edge habitats, right? So um, not so much in an empty field, right? Not so much on your lawn. It'll be, if you have a, if you have a, um, a, a lawn or a backyard that abuts a, a forested area, that's a good spot for ticks. Um, and who's at risk for getting bitten by ticks? Everyone, but it's, it's, it's really people that spend a lot of time walking around, walking around in these kinds of areas, right? So, People whose livelihoods depend on it, so people that do forestry, but if you like to hike, if you like to, um, you know, get out in nature, camp, that sort of thing, um, pick blueberries, which is a lot of fun, and everyone should do that, and it's a good thing to do. 
Um, and, and if you're like me and I like to hike and I like to camp, um, uh, and, and I and actually recommend everyone um, get out in nature. And we have wonderful parks on Staten Island. And don't let the ticks stop you. Um, but that's, you know, if you do those activities, that's where, when you have to be aware of the ticks. OK, so I want to kind of go through really quickly um, our surveillance program uh, on Staten Island. So if you look at this picture, um, this is our uh, 24 parks. It's hard to see, but um, the ones that are shaded in blue, uh, we've been doing for a while, but they were sort of pre 2018 and pre 2018's 14 parks. Green, we added starting this year because we got additional funding. So that adds, you know, 14 plus 10 is 24. So now we have 24 parks where we're doing surveillance. Um, and we do that surveillance monthly. Um, that's, that's some of our team walking around in a park doing surveillance. And so if you ever see my team out there, say hi to them. They're not doing, you know, they're not looking for, uh, they're not space aliens or anything like that. And those hazmat suits, they'll talk to you and answer questions and stuff like that. It might be John sitting here. Um, so how do we do surveillance? We don't, if, if we don't, we don't go through the whole entire park. Uh, we select a particular spot and then we do what they call um, tick dragging. You take a white cloth. And there, there he's holding the white cloth. And you drag a certain spot. And you go back to that spot repeatedly. And you could take measurements of how big that spot is and how many ticks you're collecting on that cloth. And that gives you an idea of, of the density. So ticks per square meter. Does that make sense? Right? And you could pick up the cloth. And there's a picture of you know, the ticks being kind of embedded on the cloth. You bring them back to the lab. We have a lab. Uh, in, uh, at the public health laboratory, and you can figure out what species each tick is. And then what we do is we take each tick, each tick is a sample, and we can test the tick itself for different pathogens, right? Okay, so these are the ticks, these are the uh, medically important ticks, the black-legged tick, the American dog tick, and the Lone Star tick. Uh, black-legged tick is primarily responsible for Lyme disease, right? Um, incidentally, the American dog tick, what do you think, what host do you think the American dog tick <laughs> really likes? <laughs> dogs, right? Th they really like dogs. So, and dogs, to me, are like tick magnets. Every time I bring my dog out, the dog has three or four ticks. So they're larger, they're brown, you'll see them crawling around your dog, and you pick them all. Uh, and then we have this new, um, it's uh, called the Asian longhorn tick. Uh, discovered, um, it was discovered last year, but we actually have, we found um, examples of them from 2014. Um, and uh, it's kind of an invasive species. We found them in Staten Island, uh, Brooklyn, and the Bronx, um, and um, actually in quite large numbers. Um, so um, th it's, it's just a new species, not clear, you know, what the uh, outcome of that will be in terms of medical significance. Okay, so here's some data. Um, this is data from 2018 um, that, that shows the different types of ticks and, and what parks they're, they're in on Staten Island. And this is the, so this is from 2018. So this is the 14 parks, not the 24 parks, right? So Clay Pit Pond Park, right? Clay Pit Pond Park, big giant park uh, with a lot of deer. It's, um, uh, not a lot of, of uh, houses right in the park and that sort of thing. Uh, and if you notice, Clay Pit Pond Park has, uh, you know, a lot of different types of ticks. The parks that are in, on the northern part of the island, Silver Lake Park, uh, we added several uh, surveillance sites on, in the northern part of the island with, in 2019, but Silver Lake Park doesn't appear to have as many ticks, right? There's not a lot. Of, there's not as many deer as, it, you know, Clay Pit Pond Park in Silver Lake Park, right? And here's um, so we, we, when we tested the ticks, we look for actual percentage of ticks that have 
these different pathogens and, and focusing obviously on, on Lyme disease. So this is the percentage of ticks that we collected in each of these years that had, that were infected with Lyme, right? And you could see uh, up to 30% in 2014 were infected. Right now, what we're seeing on Staten Island is it's settling around 20% of our specimens that we're collecting infected with Lyme. And if you compare that with, so here's a slide that looks at data from this, the rest of the state. So this first, it's confusing, but this first bar here, not the first bar, which is tick density in the rest of the state. So the rest of the state has, you know, more ticks than Staten Island does. That's that first bar. The second bar uh, is uh, the um, bacteria. It's the name of the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, right? So you can see, you know, outside of Staten Island, a greater percentage of ticks generally have, have Lyme. Okay. <coughs> That's one of the things that we found. Um, so what we're trying to do now, um, starting, starting this year, is um, looking at ways to actually control ticks. Controlling ticks is kind of a new thing. Um, and um, it's, uh, uh, there are a lot of new products and new technologies that we're kind of investigating. So we're doing a pilot, piloting in three parks um, some products. Uh, one of them is called MET52. MET52 is a, a, um, a, a pesticide that uh, uses a um, fungus, uh, so it's kind of natural uh, pesticides, less toxic than other types of pesticides. We're also um, using um, these uh, tick uh, bait boxes, and John, if you want um, to show everybody, I, I was going to pass them around, but it's such a huge crowd, I, I don't think it's a good idea to actually pass them around, but if people want to come down and take a look at them, you're welcome to take a look at them. They don't, in, when you buy them and deploy them, they don't come apart like this, but um, basically what it is is it's like a um, uh, I think somebody referred to them as, as car washes from mice. So the mice are, the mice are attracted to the, um, the bait blocks that are inside the bait station. That's non-toxic sort of bait that just attracts the mice. It doesn't provide any nutritional value for the mice, so we're not, we're not growing you know, mice, right? <laughs> the mice are an important host in the life cycle of the tick, right? And they also are the um, reservoir for um, the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. That's where the tick gets the Lyme disease. Tick doesn't, isn't born with the Lyme disease, it gets it from the mice. So the idea is the mice go into this bait box, they, 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 go, to eat the, uh, they go to eat the bait, and, they, and the outside of the, the, the mice, the mouse's coat is coated with a low level of pesticide called fripanil. Uh, which, which then kills the ticks for several weeks. So we, over time, we get less ticks. It's a good idea. It's, it's proven to be effective in certain applications, not something that homeowners can buy these right now. You need, a, uh, you need to be a licensed exterminator to um, apply these. Um, but, uh, you know, we're going to test them and see how well they, they work. Um, this is the uh, this is the uh, the Met 52. Um, those are pictures of ticks that are infected with the um, with the fungus, and it's not you know obviously not pretty. Um, so again, we'll see how well they work. Right now, um, we're having a problem sourcing the product. Uh, Met 52 is made by one company, and they had a problem with growing the fungus in their factory. So uh, there's supposed to be better um, distribution coming online, but that's when, you, when you're using new technology, these are the things that you're dealing with. Uh, I won't, um, Sally very ably talked about all the outreach things that we do. We do a lot of outreach as well um, to talk about ticks and how to prevent ticks and that sort of thing. And work, we work with all these different groups. And, um, uh, and, and of course, the, the um, Parks Department and the Greenbelt Conservancy 
are great partners um, for us and many others. And um, I, I uh, Safe Kids Coalition. So we've done uh, we've done presentations, we've done outreach at all these different venues. Um, and here's here's our um, Twitter and Facebook, Instagram. If you want to learn more about ticks that way, you could track us down, or you could just send us an email the old-fashioned way and ask them. All right, thank you. I just want to jump in here uh, real quick just to piggyback on that. So when Eddie Burke uh, made us go to Dutchess County to meet Dr. Osfeld, that's when we first came upon, uh, they have something called the Tick Project. That's when we first learned about uh, MET 52 uh, and the car wash. Um, I think from an academic or a scientific point of view, Dr. Osfeld uh, was not really prepared for us to say, well, we want to take that and try it out in Staten Island. He was still undergoing, I think, a two-year study in Dutchess County they were in the first year, but we kind of got ahead of ourselves because that's what we do. <laughs> and we went to Mayor de Blasio and we said, yeah, we have to do something. And we um, advocated and that's where we got the funding and for those. I do want to say, um, we, you can't buy the car wash but you can buy something called the tick tubes. Um, and what the tick tubes are um, is it looks like, I don't know, the inside of a roll of toilet paper, right, the cardboard, and stuck in it is cotton that's treated with the same chemical. And the mice allegedly will grab, go, go in that tube, take some of that cotton out to go build their home and their nest, and then they touch the cotton that has the chemical that essentially does the same car wash. And they sell it on Amazon, for those of you who are like me, who have, want, I have plenty at home if you want to stop over. <laughs> I cornered the market on, like sponges, like Elaine on Seinfeld. All right, let's keep this going. Next up is Columbia University. Dr. Maria Duke Wasser is Associate Professor, Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology at Columbia. And I really applaud Columbia and Maria and her team because they've been on Staten Island. They've been talking to Staten Islanders and they've been uh, really on the front lines of getting uh, uh, to know this issue a bit better. So here are the results. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for inviting us to show some of the work that we've been doing on Staten Island. So I moved to uh, Columbia University about five years ago from uh, Yale, which is in Connecticut, like, you know, lots of ticks on Lyme there. I was surprised to hear that there's ticks in New York City. So it was, uh, you know, for a scientist studying ticks is positive in a way because I got to learn. And I think there's, you know, we talk a lot about there's hope here. It's easier. The infections are lower. So I think there's hope to do something to really control Lyme disease in, a, in an urban setting. So I'm going to have a, re a relatively shorter presentation. Some of the topics have been covered, but there's going to be time for questions. So in our research, what we ask mainly three questions. We want to know where the ticks are coming from. The ticks are on Staten Island, how they're moving around the island. That's the first thing. The second is, how are the ticks getting infected? What's the source of the infection of the Lyme bacterium and others? other pathogens, and finally, where are people getting them? Are they getting them in their house? Are they getting them in the parks? Because if we're gonna intervene and efficiently control it, we wanna know where are people getting the infected ticks. If people are getting them in their yards and we go and control the parks, it's not gonna be effective. We're really not gonna have such an impact. So we have a number of projects. We have actually 14 people currently working. Some of them are sitting up there on Staten Island from my lab. We want to really get at how the ticks interact with the animals. Those are the projects on the left that I'm going to go one by one. And on the right, there's projects looking at how the ticks interact with us. Where do we get the ticks? And so the cycle ha uh, um, has already been, uh, been described in another talk, but I'm just going to go quickly. The larvae will obtain uh, the first blood meal, and that's where they get infected. And not all the hosts are equal. So some animals, like mice and chipmunks, are really good at infecting the ticks versus others that are not as good. Then they will drop off and, and emerge as nymphs, and then they, they have the opportunity to bite an animal and infect an animal or infect us and in different ways, and then they drop off and they will actually uh, feed on large animals, especially deer. So deer are an essential host for the ticks. That's where the ticks mate and where they re reproduce. 
So with no deer, there's actually no ticks, unless we have some other mammals, but typically they're really important. However, the ticks do not infect the tick with the Borrelia. So we need other animals that are gonna infect the ticks, such as mice or nymphs, or uh, sorry, mice or chipmunks, for example. So we need both. We need deer and we need mice or another host. So the first project, how do ticks get around? And Meredith uh, Van Acker in my lab, who unfortunately couldn't be here, has done a great project in, this is 2017, going all through New York City and asking, are there ticks in this park? And she did some modeling to look at, okay, what is the main factor determining whether there's ticks or not? And she found that the connectivity between the parks, the proximity of other parks and green corridors between them is the most important factor. So most of New York City has no ticks because the deer can't get there. Unfortunately, Staten Island, the deer are able to get all through Staten Island and deposit ticks and infection through the island because we have the green belt and that's so unfortunate that that beautiful green belt you know, has helped also deer and ticks to get around. Uh, so then in New uh, we're actually doing this interesting modeling where we think about the parks on Staten Island as an electric circuit. So we're thinking, okay, if we take out we, it, this is kind of complex modeling, but if we take out one park, they may reduce the connectivity of all these parks for Lyme disease. And actually, Meredith found that the parks that are more connected to other parks have more ticks and more infection there. So that's the key. And we're actually following the deer that are radio tracked, part of the White Buffalo Desterilization Project. We're using that data to really understand how deer are moving through the, the uh, borough. Then the other question is where they're getting infected. So for that, uh, there's a team that is sampling mice and chipmunks in those traps up there, and then also uh, taking pictures of other animals to understand what animals might the ticks be feeding on. And we have found that about 30% of the mice are infected with Borrelia and about 20% with Babesia. And seven out of eight parks studied had Borrelia infected mice. Babesia was only present in three out of eight. Babesia is kind of a lower, less inf infection. So we have an idea of how the, the animals are infecting the ticks. And now we're expanding from that. We have several projects starting now, uh, trying to understand the other players in the cycle. So Laura in my lab has, is studying cats, uh, community cats and feral cats, trying to see if the cats are eating the mice, if they are getting the ticks or bringing them to you. We think my, cats may bring the, the cats to yards, for example. So that's one project. The other one where uh, Danielle up there will be trapping raccoons and possums. That's going to be challenging, but we're going to trap them and try to see if they are feeding the ticks and if they are infecting them with things, especially the new longhorn tick, which seems to like raccoons. So maybe they are eating, they are feeding on raccoons. We do not find the new tick on mice, which is good news because they would be getting all those pathogens. So, but maybe they're getting them from the, they could get them from the longhorn. So that's another project. And finally, we're trying to understand the types of vegetation that best explain why we have a lot of mice or ticks in different locations. So those are projects starting this year. We're very active doing that. And the last question, where are people getting the ticks? And Pilar Fernandez it will be, is leading a team. Some of them are up there uh, trying to see first the houses that are next to the parks. So they're going house by house. Some maybe of you have been visited and checking people's yards, looking at what kind of yards do you have? what animals might be visiting those yards, and also asking people questions about what they know, what precautions do they take. And actually, we're gonna be trying some of those boxes in the yards. They're actually being used before in yards, but we don't really know if even the mice come to your yard. So one of the questions will be, is that a reasonable project to use in a place like Staten Island? Do the mice visit them? And if so, do they clean them from ticks? So finally, the other question, so these are some of the results. So these are the proportion of people exposed to ticks, and that varies through the island. You see the North Shore, there's lower a percent. Is one of the, this was a small sample last year. And then most of the houses are exposed in the south and also in the center. So there's different proportions, but about a third of the yards we visited had ticks on them. So certainly people could be getting ticks on their yards. And they have different species of ticks. So in the south, we get the three species of ticks that Mario was, Merlina was talking about. So the next question, let's go to the parks. Let's see what people are doing in the parks. So Erin Hassett from Cornell collaborates with us. And she has been actually looking what people are doing in the parks. 
So she's observing people, doing people behavior, looking what type of areas do people use? You know, are, are, do they get into the brush? Do they use the grass? And then she goes and collects ticks in those areas. So tries to see what ticks maybe people encountering based on their movement in the yard, in the parks. So that's a spreadsheet she writes out down, and then she asks them some questions. And finally, we put all this together with an app. It's called the Tick app. So you can download it for free now if you're interested. I hope a lot of people do. And the app is both a research tool and an educational tool. So if you want, what we ask you is that for 15 days, you log in and say, what did I do today? Did I find a tick on myself? And did I wear any protection? Either if you find them or not. So we get a sense of what people are doing and where are they getting exposed to ticks. And then there's tons of good information you can get as well. But there is a little bit of a questionnaire, an initial questionnaire to help us understand what are the risk factors for people to get Lyme disease. So that is uh, ongoing. And uh, we found already some things from the questionnaires on the app. We found out that uh, like uh, three quarters of people on the on Staten Island have seen ticks. More than half have found ticks on themselves or their pets. And then, uh, but we also found out that a lot of people don't really know about the st three different ticks. So we need to get educated. Not all ticks are the same. We have multiple, actually four ticks with the long horn now. Then we also have found that most people um, with their reported tick encounters, 25% of the users actually did find a tick. And then we found that in the yard was actually higher than in recreational areas. So we always think the parks, but people were getting them in their yards. And then we also found out the different species of ticks that are being reported. If you find a tick on yourself, you can send it to us and we can tell you what species of tick, if we can see the picture clearly, what it is to help you out. And then in terms of what do people do to protect themselves, half of them do nothing and others do <laughs> repellent or protective clothing. <laughs> So those are, I mean, maybe they are not at risk. So we still need to analyze this data to cross, you know, who answered each question, but those are uh, first. And the app is nationwide, and we have good collaborators in the Midwest, so we're also comparing behaviors in different regions, trying to understand that. So in sum, the deer really distribute the ticks, and the mice and other hosts infect the ticks. We really need to understand if it's just mice, chipmunks, or raccoons, or other animals, all of them could infect the ticks. The park connectivity is key. The deer need to be able to get from park to park. If we are able to somehow stop that, and now with the deer reduction efforts, we may be able to bring deer down num numbers down to a point where maybe they don't visit all the parks. So that's kind of the connectivity is the a challenge. People encounter it takes both in their backyard and in the parks. So we want to know to what extent that they get both where exactly in which parks and where exactly in which yards. And then we need to determine how other hosts might be bringing ticks to your yard, because sometimes we found yards with big you know, fences, and they still had ticks. So how do they get there? Something is bringing the ticks into the yard. Could be the deer, could be mice, could be cats, could be many things. So this information, we think, is key to really target our interventions, to really decide what we want to target. Do we want to kill the ticks? Do we want to reduce the deer? Do we want to do car washes, what do we want to do? And then uh, be able to target them to the right population, people that are most at risk, and also educate people uh, as, mar as much as we can to reduce the risk. So I have an amazing lab, as I said, 14 people are in, on Staten Island this year that are doing all this work. Hopefully you run into them. And then also we are supported by CDC. We're part of a regional center of excellence in vector-borne diseases. But we also accept donations because we're running out of funds for all this project. So if you're so feel inclined, we have a website there. But thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, our final presenter is Dr. Christopher Pappas from Manhattanville College. I attended um, a talk he gave to the students at McGowan not long ago, and I was very intrigued, even though I heard it before, about his description of how we can live our lives in our home and our yards um, and be more aware of ticks, and then he showed how to remove a tick. And it was three weeks later that I got my tick embedded in my stomach. So hopefully, it doesn't mean anything except that he's going to tell you what to be aware of should you ever have a tick. This is Dr. Chris Pappas. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks also to the borough president and deputy borough president for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, I also want to say the work that the DOH is doing everything is impeccable work. It really comes down to the idea, what everybody's really reinforcing the idea is this is prevention versus the cure. If you could prevent being bit by a tick, then you don't have to worry about treatments, et cetera, and everything else goes down the line. So 
as you can see, this is the uh, title of my talk, but I actually have an alternative title to the talk. It's Be Like Derek Jeter. <laughs> so I thought this was appropriate for Staten Island. Um, basic idea is Derek Jeter was one of the best shortstops of all time. Why is that? It wasn't just that he was very, uh, had good athletic prowess. It's that he actually knew for every single one of the batters what the percentage is where they would hit the ball. So if you know where the ball is going to go, then you position yourself in that position. It's the exact same thing for ticks. So if you know where the ticks are going to be located, you can take preventative measures to make sure you don't come in contact with those ticks. So this is just a little bit about me. I've been doing this for about 15 years now. Um, I consider myself a little bit of a tick whisperer. I've worked with ticks, 2,000, 3,000 ticks in the labs at different times. Um, and I focus on bacteria that, such as Lyme disease and also leptospirosis. So to reinforce a little bit what DOH was saying earlier, and also uh, the other professors, you actually have to do a lot of things to get a tick-borne disease. The first thing you have to do is come into contact with the tick. That's the first thing. So if you know where they're located, you can prevent going into those areas. Then once you come into contact with a tick, the tick actually has to attach to you, which is actually a feed on and of itself, and I'll show you why. You have to have the tick attached for a prolonged period of time. As DOH pointed out, 24 to 48 hours are necessary, typically before, for example, the Lyme disease, Lyme disease bacterium begins to transmit to you. And with that concept, also, the tick itself has to carry that bacteria. So the same as you saw from the data, typically one out of five ticks actually carry the Lyme disease bacterium. The others don't. So you've got a, a chance there it may not have it. Uh, the pathogen has to be transferred to you, so it has to have at least that 24 to 48 hours. And the big thing also is, after all that, if all that has happened, it has been transmitted, don't follow up for prophylactic care with a physician. The sooner you get to a physician, begin prophylactic care, the better the result outcome for you. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what ticks are like and what really attracts them. And what you have to keep in mind is ticks are animals, and we're an animal. And the big thing is, and this is a big point, as animals, the ticks don't know you exist. The ticks are looking for mice, they're looking for deer, they're looking for other small rodents. They don't know that humans exist. But they're looking when they attach to you for the same environmental cues that they're on side of a host. So they're looking, for example, the animal odors that you have on your skin. They're looking for all those skin textures, the bumps, the hair on your skin. And all of your skin has a carbon dioxide trail. They love carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide lets a tick know that they're in the proximity of a host. If they're in a questing behavior, if you blow on them, and I'll, I'll show you later on, I brought some ticks with me that are pathogen free. They actually begin questing immediately. Their, their tarsi, their front legs go up in the air because they say, ooh, something is juicy nearby. And they do this because, for example, the deer tick don't have eyes. Okay, so they have to relate on all these different environmental cues just to get to that point. They're also looking for variances in temperature. I'll mention one thing with the carbon dioxide, which is always very interesting. People think about it. Um, with carbon dioxide, DOH brought this up near roadways. Roadways are a big point, again, where you may find deer ticks because, again, different animals traverse past the roads. And as they go there, they may, you know, leave some ticks behind. But all those cars going down the road are dropping CO2 trails. So lots of different research studies have shown that near different roadways, you can get a, a larger distribution or d density of ticks in those areas. So think about the next time you have to pull over by the side of the road and change your uh, tire, because you have a flat tire. It's a good idea that night, again, to do a tick check, because you might have come into contact with ticks, especially if there's a big brush in that area. Now, the other thing with ticks, so that's why ticks are looking for you. That's what they're going for the cues. At the same time, they're going to avoid areas that dry them out. Deer ticks hate becoming dried out or desiccated. Deer ticks really want environments more than 90% relative humidity. That is not this room. 90% relative humidity is, for example, underneath leaf litter, underneath nice shaded grass areas where it's got that dew fall in the early morning. That's an ideal tick environment. What's not an ideal tick environment is bright grass, uh, short grass areas with lots of sunlight. So they're really gonna stick to, area, excuse me, to areas where it's nice and moist. Uh, they're gonna avoid those dry exposed areas like sandy areas, uh, very sunny areas. So for example, if you take out trees in the middle of your lawn, they're going to avoid more of those areas if there's a lot of sun, anything they can dry them out. And what they're going to seek out instead are more tallish grasses, anything long enough that they can attach to for that questing behavior. So thinking back again to the idea as far as what are ticks looking for, well, if I'm the first two stages of a tick, if I'm a larvae or I'm a nymph, all right, so that's the baby and the teenage stage, I really want to get onto a small animal. So I want to increase my chance of getting on that animal versus other animals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to climb a very small blade of grass. As I climb the very small blade of grass, I'm the same height as, a, as, a, as a, uh, a mouse, and that'll increase my likelihood of attaching to that. At the same time, 
as I'm on this small blade of grass, if I start noticing myself getting dried out, I can drop off the blade of grass, go back down to the, to the, to the, bed, uh, let, uh, the litter at the bottom of the, uh, the soil, and rehydrate as I need to. As I become an adult, I'm actually going to climb longer blades of grass because now I want to exclude those small rodents, and instead I want to get onto that deer. So now I'm going to go onto a longer blade of grass. But that's really where they're going to be doing the questing behavior for you and what you're going to be going across. So again, thinking about where ticks are located for the most part, we're talking about waist height or below. Uh, they're going to look for those wind-protected areas, shaded areas. You can see over here from the picture, we see a questing tick again. Um, and we can see, again, that shaded area. Again, near leaf litter, they love leaf litter. That's where you're going to find them more often than not. So there's a lot of different things you can prevent, uh, do to prevent yourself from being bit by ticks in your environment. Lawn care is one of the big ones. I know you guys can't have backyard chickens in Staten Island, but there's been a lot of people that say that you know, uh, chickens are very, very good for bringing down uh, tick density in an area. Some studies have shown chickens will eat like 200 ticks in 20 minutes. At the same time, a lot of reports are now coming out that people that have backyard chickens also have a propensity to get uh, salmonella poisoning. Oh. So oh, yeah, you got to take your choices here a little bit, right? Um, Big thing, obviously, watch out around highways, any areas where there's more CO2 trails, watch out for those things. Wear lighter cl colored clothing, you know, anything where you can see the tick. If I'm wearing darker colored clothing when I hike, you know, you go to REI Sports or whatever, they'll sell you darker colored clothing. Get the lighter colored clothing because you can see the ticks. And what I'm going to show you later on, I have nymphs with me and also adults. The adults, everybody sees like that. The nymphs, people say, that's a nymph. They are extremely small, the size of a poppy seed. You miss them every single time. So you need to be aware of that and really do a good look on that. Um, tucking pads into socks helps. Treat it with permethrin. I'll talk about permethrin in a little bit. That's a really nice uh, trick as well. Clean clothes by uh, tossing them in the dryer. So a lot of people think, you know, I can just put in the washing machine, everything's good. Well, in my research, uh, we have to wash the ticks if we're going to extract DNA first. We put them in bleach. We put them in hydrogen peroxide. We put them in detergent. They just smile. <laughs> the second I put them with ethanol, they're done because ethanol dries them right out immediately. Same thing with your dryer. So the dryer, what it's going to do for you, put them on at least a 10-minute cycle. The, the clothes have to be dry by that point. It will dry them out, and then they'll also desiccate and die. It's the same thing. If I put a tick here on this uh, podium, this is less than 90% relative humidity. The likelihood this will be here tomorrow and alive is very, very negligible. All right, so they need that high humidity to survive. Uh, take care when walking a pet. We know, again, that pets uh, increase your likelihood of getting a tick on you. And keep in mind also, if you ever do find your pet has ticks on it or a major infestation, maybe you're walking through an area, if you don't have a tick treatment at your house, you can run it down to the vet or any one of those uh, shelters, you know, like, uh, what do you call them, the place where you put your dogs away for, for a couple weeks? A kennel. A kennel, right. So you put them in a kennel, and they usually have the treatments right there. Also, they'll treat them on the spot, and then the ticks drop right back off. Daily ch tick checks, I'm going to talk about how often that is, uh, spoiler alert, every day for the next two months or so. And EPA-approved repellents, we'll talk about that. The, the lawn care guide is really, really good. More than anything, you're trying to set up a barrier zone between yourself and the ticks, especially if you're living near these wooded areas. You're going to say, again, there are ticks in those woods. I can't do anything about those ticks. But what I can do is prevent those ticks from migrating to the lawn where I want my kids to play. And I'll show you a couple of pictures of that. So you're going to have that nice wood chip area and then a tick migration zone and then what we really call the tick-free zone, and you're living in the tick-free zone. And there's a lot of things you can do in the tick-free zone to make it more uh, resistant to getting ticks in there. So all these pictures here, and I'll walk you from the top and over. So the top two pictures, those are nice tick habitats. Shaded areas, longer grass. It's got the uh, leaf litter at the bottom. Ticks like this area. You're most likely, when I walk through there, I'm now aware. It doesn't mean I'm not going to walk through there. It just means I'm aware, vigilant, alert, and I'm going to have to do a tick check later on. And before I walked in there, probably apply DEET. Moving over, we see the, uh, the kids' playground in the shaded area. This is the most common thing I see when I go to my, my, uh, my kids' friends' houses. The playground is always tossed into the, into the corner of the yard. Bring it into the middle of the yard. You actually want it to be low-cut grass. Ticks don't like that. Take away the trees. Put down that wood chip if you want to. But lots of sunlight. Think about it again. Desiccating the ticks is going to dry them out. It's going to help to prevent those ticks from being transmitted over. So this is most likely on the right. Much less ticks or no likelihood of ticks being there, most likely. Uh, these are some pictures from the bottom near my house. Uh, picture on the bottom left, absolutely tick zone. These other two, and you can see in the middle, it's the same cul-de-sac area. You will find ticks there. When we've done surveying there, we found ticks before. But as you move out into the lawn, as you move away from the forested area, away from the longer grass into more well-cut grass, more sunlight, the tick population begins to drop immediately. Um, so that's something to always keep in mind. So think about your own house, what it looks like as far as where you're staying and uh, what you have there. So 
So talk to you a second out. That's how you're going to prevent the ticks from coming into your environment. But at the same time, you really can't prevent every tick. That's the idea as far as the first point, coming into contact with the ticks. The other point is, what happens if a tick comes into contact with me? How can I prevent them from attaching? EPA approved repellents. The key word there, and I really do recommend you do it, go to the EPA website. There's a whole list of different studies that have been done. I've done some studies, other people have done studies that are wonderful to try to say what repellents work, how do they work, you know, what concentration you need them to work, and stick with one of these repellents, okay? They're safe for human use, and at the same time, they're going to make sure the tick doesn't attach you. I'll show you what this looks like in a second. One of the new chemicals, or one of the chemicals people are getting more contact with nowadays is permethrin. A lot of times when I say permethrin, people get scared. They say, oh, permethrin sounds like a really bad chemical. At the same time, um, if you've ever heard of uh, head lice, when we treat kids for head lice and we give them nicks, that's permethrin. All right, we've been putting it on our kids for years. In fact, it's a nice residual chemical. That means it sticks around for a long period of time. When you treat your clothes with permethrin, you're not going to put this on your skin. It's a different type of treatment. But when you put it on your clothing, it lasts usually for about six weeks or six washes. That's fantastic. So that basically means anything you're doing hiking or your gardening or your woodwork, put it on that clothing. One thing that I've started to apply to as well are my jogging shoes. Because when I go running, I always start on the road, but then I find myself, oh, that's a nice trail over there. And now I'm off-road. I didn't apply DEET, but at least I've got the permethrin on my, my runners, so that way it helps me out. So um, permethrin is nice. Usually I have to go online to find it. Okay, so DEET is an excellent and very effective repellent. Um, we can see here this is uh, my hand. This is called a bioassay. It's a vertical bioassay. Ticks like to climb. And as it's climbing, I want you to notice a couple of different things. It's meandering, the same as the OH was talking about. It doesn't go in a straight line. It's feeling those different cues. It detects the CO2 trail. It feels the bumps, the ridges, the hair. And it's just going to keep on climbing up and up and up. There is no D on my skin right now. Okay, So I just let it do a 30-second climb, and it will continue that path. But this is the big thing. Ticks meander for a while. They meander usually for about one to two hours. That means if you're out in the woods and you come in and take a shower, the likelihood that you may just wash off a tick right away also increases. Now, if we watch this second video, this is, again, same finger, but now I applied DEET to it. And I didn't apply 100% DEET. I applied 30% DEET. 25% to 30% DEET is all you really need. And here's the same climb. The DEET is applied right at this knuckle point. Now watch the arms of the tick. See, it doesn't like it. They immediately go up because it feels a repellent. DEET is an actual a repellent. It's not a masking odor. They don't like how it smells. It's very stinky to them. They just drop off. So imagine if you're walking through the woods now and you walk by a questing tick and it feels that, it's actually repelled, it's pushing away and back, it doesn't attach to you. And that's the really good advantage of that. Uh, tick check hotspots. This picture should actually look really familiar to you. When DOA showed it, it was a picture of a dog. But in fact, it's the exact same areas we see on a dog as us because remember, they don't know what humans are. They're going to the same areas they think an animal is. And where is an animal bad at grooming? Animals are bad at grooming the nape of the neck, behind the ears, all right? The groin, under the arms, behind the knees between the toes. So a lot of times ticks, where you're going to find them as far as the, the hot spots, it's going to be in those regions as well. Um, this should be done every day. And this is the other thing I'll tell you. You know, the same as they, they talked about, ticks feed for multiple days, depending upon which stage they're in. The nymphs can feed for three to four days, adults for up to seven days sometimes. So that means you've actually got a lot of time to detect that tick. So if I went hiking tonight, I wouldn't just do a tick check tonight. I'd do it for the next few days because as it keeps on getting bigger and bigger and engorging, my likelihood of seeing it and pulling it off also increases. And how to remove a tick. Now, this is the big thing. So you find a tick. So first you try to avoid the area, put on the, forgot to put on repellent, didn't do a tick check the first day or take a shower, and now we have one that's actually embedded in our skin. How are we going to remove it? Here's some things you're not going to do. You're not going to put a match on it. You're not going to put petroleum jelly on it. All right, nail polish, you're not going to sing to it. It's not going to work. <laughs> what you're going to do is you're going to get tick forceps, OK? And these are just fine point forceps. Um, and you need to get right at the mouth parts, the same as the OH was showing earlier. We can see another picture down here. These are the chelacer and the hypostome, all right? That's the barbed part right there. These are the palps. These actually push out to the side. But right here in the middle, that's what's actually embedded in the skin. What you want to do is try to get as all of that material out and a, a microscopic amount of skin comes out as well at the same time if you do a good job. If you do any of these other methods, it can stress the tick. And if you stress the tick, then you get in a situation where it may begin to regurgitate or something else may happen, and then it actually pushes that blood that it originally took in back into your skin. If there's any pathogen in there, then it could be transmitted to you. So you want to be playing the game of uh, you know, almost like a silent warrior 
they don't know you're there. You just slip the forceps in, and then one smooth pull out, and the tick comes right out. And it's really, it's really easy. Once you've done it a few times, especially, every single time you do it, it's, it's a clean move. Now, here's the other thing. Once you do that, here's the other thing I'll tell you about this as well. Uh, I do two things here. So when I go hiking, my, my family's always out in the woods. I actually keep a first aid kit in my car, just a one-day first aid kit. The nice thing with that is it's got the different alcohol swabs, et cetera, for later on. But I also keep a pair of tick forceps in there. And then in my house, I also have a pair of tick forceps. The last thing you want to do is find a tick on you and be on Amazon Prime that night. <laughs> Not the time for it, all right? So make sure you go ahead and order them today. If you want, pull it up later, and I'll help you find uh, some good forceps for you. Um, and the other thing you can do is obviously keep the tick, OK? Keeping the tick is a great idea. It's one of these things, again, as far as definitive diagnosis or just knowing if it was a tick. Sometimes people have things on them that aren't ticks. Also being able to speciate, tell which type of tick it is. These are all important to say, like, oh, that's actually, you know, a dermatic center, okay? That doesn't carry Lyme disease, stuff like that. That's what the physician will be able to do for you. So all you got to do is take that tick. When you take it off, put it on a piece of tape, stick it on the fridge. When you go to the physicians, bring it with you. You're all set. You could also put it in ethanol or alcohol. Um, the, the lighter spirits are better. You can keep your 15-year aged uh, scotch you want, clear alcohol so you can actually see it, pull it back out, and you can still do DNA analysis on those as well. And... Um, that's about it. I hope that's informative for you. I thank you for your time. Uh, this is a little bit of my lab group. If you want more information, especially like the videos, I have it on YouTube. You can always look at it. And I do have ticks with me. They're pathogen-free. They've been reared inside a facility for generations and generations and generations. And I'll pull them out so you can see the different sizes of the ticks later on. But also, we'll look at a little bit of the questing behavior and how they, their motivation for movement is. Okay? So thank you, guys. Um, Bring those live ticks right close to the borough president. He would love it. All right, so we're going to move now to questions and answers. Um, so the staff will get some of those Q&As that you wrote on cards ready. Questions? Dr. Viscont, do you have them? Come on up. Okay, I've got one for you. All right. Uh, what other uh, insects carry the Borrelia species? So just, just to keep in mind, when we think about ticks or what's going to transfer, what are, what's going to actually be able to, to carry a pathogen, um, the internal physiology of a tick, every, every species of tick is going to be different. You know, we're talking about the exodes ticks that can carry uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. Um, it's almost like a car. So if you've got a car that takes gasoline, you can't put diesel in it. That's the basic idea. So you have to be tick specific, and they evolve together to be able to complete that transmission cycle. If you try to take it and put it inside of a different species, it's not going to work. The same as if you try to put it inside of an insect, it, it's not going to work because it's not, it's not compatible those two things together. Does that make sense? That's the idea. Another intelligent question. Are there typically co-infections with Lyme? Uh, I've heard that infections never travel alone. So uh, if I get bit by a tick, am I going to get other infections as well? Well, speaking for human surveillance and what we've seen uh, mm -hmm. on Staten Island, so uh, co-infections can definitely occur depending on what other animals um, that tick has fed on and um, acquired leading up to the time that it bites you. So if it feeds on one animal that might have multiple pathogens or a series of animals and acquires multiple pathogens, co-infections uh, certainly are possible. In terms of what we've seen, we have not seen a lot of that um, based on our surveillance data, um, but it does, and certainly the tick data suggests that we don't see uh, a large number of the uh, exoides scapularis testing positive for anaplasma babesia. However, it does seem more recently we are definitely seeing a lot more people uh, with evidence of Babesia, so I would expect we're going to see more co-infections with <laughs> Lyme and Babesia. So yes, it can happen, uh, but it just depends on what's happening in the environment where you live that would lead to the possibility of co-infections occurring. Yes, and I, I, I would just add to that, it's how many times you've been bit. Uh, I have a number of patients that live in environments where they're continually bit. Um, <clears throat> I finish treating them for one infection, and then a month or two later they come back and they have more ticks mm -hmm. from uh, where they live. They haven't done the necessary uh, things that they should do. Sometimes they can't do the things that they should do, like move. 
Uh, it's not possible. Uh, I have one patient who really can't move. Okay, is Lyme uh, treated with antibiotics for 21 days, or is other testing needed to determine if the disease is gone? It's a great question. Dr. Justin. Yeah. So once again, doxycycline, amoxicillin, and cefuroxin. The question is, uh, should you treat it for 21 days? Um, it is uh, said by the CDC that you can treat from any time 10 to 21 days. So approximately 14 days would be sufficient. But that is if you have the early Lyme. But if you have the disseminated Lyme, uh, which involves the heart, uh, if the patient has a carditis like I did see a patient very recently, a 19-year-old college student, who uh, came back, uh, went to Sweden and came back, but he didn't get Lyme disease there. Uh, he went to his primary care physician because uh, he was not feeling too good. And the primary care physician was very wise. He did an EKG and found that this young boy had a heart block. So it was very critical that he should be sent to the hospital immediately and be monitored in a coronary care unit so he came to Ramsey and uh, rightfully he was diagnosed with Lyme carditis. So to answer this question, um, uh, and he was positive for the Lyme titus, he was treated for 21 days. So if you have a disseminated Lyme involving the nervous system or the heart, or even if it's the arthritis, you would go for 21 days. But if it is caught early, 14 days should be sufficient. If there is cement in your backyard, would it be considered a safe area? Now, there's a now that's a where I live. <laughs> Dr. Pappas, you want to take that one? So uh, if we're talking specifically about deer ticks, again, I don't, I'd have to see the backyard. You know, if you had a backyard and you had that backyard, it was against uh, a fence or against a wooded area. In that area, you may have a little bit of migration. We always talk about tick migration zones. And typically, from the wood chip area where you have, you have about a four foot minimum or nine foot migration zone. So you could see some traversing, but at the same time, going back to the general idea, are they going to want to hang out there? They're not going to want to hang out there. The other thing you got to think about also is, is that a good environment for animals to pass through? All right. So if you've got a backyard that's a highway for squirrels and mice, et cetera, they're bringing more ticks into your backyard. But if you've got a cleared backyard, that isn't um, you know, really hospitable to those rodents, et cetera, you're going to have less traversing. That means less ticks are moving through there anyway. Remember, these ticks are not predatory. They're ambush uh, predators, OK? So they're waiting, all right? They're not actually actively going out and looking that way. OK, next question. OK, uh, Dr. Pappas, I think you talked about half of this question. Would you like, uh, we have a, uh, somebody in the audience who would like to know where the mice acquire Borrelia, and is anything being done to prevent that in our parks? Well, anyone can answer that. Or any. So the mice acquire it from the ticks. So it goes mm -hmm. from tick to mouse. mouse but where's the Borrelia come from? <laughs> Originally, <laughs> <laughs> it just circulates in the environment. So it's brought into our new region by uh, a, a mouse that moves or a bird and it infects the animals, so then the larvae get the Borrelia, and mm. then when it becomes an ems, it infects another mouse with Borrelia. And so it cycles continuously. It doesn't really come from anywhere. It has to cycle between mice and ticks. Okay, great. This next question, the panel decided Dr. Pappas will answer. Our, um, this is about predators of ticks, ladybugs, and praying mantises. Can we introduce them into our yards? Would that be effective? Data on that, and I wouldn't really rely on that. Again, um, really, I mean, you, you can't have chickens, but you know, bufalus, which is a major cattle tick in the south, it ravages cattle, destroys the hive, which creates a lot of problems for leather industry. Um, they've had really good results with chickens. What they're actually proposing to do, this is why, I gotta tell you, I was very uh, optimistic when I heard DOH talking to what the borough president, deputy borough president, is doing for you. The, uh, the fungicide treatment. What we know about all arthropods, they're very, very susceptible to funguses, different fungi. And so to have a fungus treatment or therapy that could actually just kill the tick like that, that's going to be more effective. I think you're going to see that as far as five, ten years on the line, as far as a really good effective control mother 
Thank you. Because again, with funguses, the other thing is resistance uh, potential is very, very low, which is another thing that's really good about it. I just want to say uh, from the health department, I don't think there's any anything at the borough at the uh, the level of the borough, but you are allowed to have chickens. You just can't have roosters. Oh. But I do want to echo, we have seen a lot of salmonella with backyard chickens, so. I have a little postscript on this question, but uh, let me ask the panel, uh, where did Lyme disease originate? Anybody want to take that one? So it's been here for millions of years. In the, U in the U.S., and so it's been around. It just uh, wasn't around, I mean, it wasn't, it, as common, but it probably, uh, because there were no, like uh, for the last hundred years, let's say hundred years ago, there were no mm -hmm. deer and forests. So Borali has persisted for a long time here and in Europe. Yes, that, that is exactly what I've heard. They found it in a uh, exhumed body from 5,000 years ago. They thought it was syphilis and it wasn't, it was Lyme. Yeah, we studied it genetically, <laughs> so we can estimate it's hundreds of thousands of years it existed, yeah. This is a powerful message that over a hundred people showed up tonight to come to a forum to learn about this data. This didn't happen years ago. And just like measles and Zika and so many diseases get a huge public outcry, this is a big out public outcry. This represents a lot of interest on Staten Island. So yeah, the more we do that, the more government officials, the more pharmaceutical companies, the more pressure on society comes to bear on this. So um, again, I just want you to know that what you did tonight is very important because you showed up. It's very hard to get people to come together for many things and you came together on this really important issue. Um, so I thank you, I thank our incredible panelists. They are unbelievably superb in there. We just had a conference call with Senator Schumer's office and the Cures Act um, provided funding to the NIH to really invest, to really pump some funds for the first time into tick-borne illnesses. So I asked for the status of it, and they said, right now there's a working group going to provide some, uh, recommendations. That's what they're waiting on. Senator Schumer's on this every month. And all those things that we care about are going to be discussed. The different bands that the blood tests are involved with, the vaccine that we want them to look at again, uh, more and more prevention, like you're hearing here, you're hearing municipalities talking about these preventive messages, the federal government maybe can get into that. That's all work coming through this working group. And then there's yet another bill, uh, the, the TIC Act essentially, which would provide yet a different set of um, funding through the CDC. So there's two important pieces of legislation at the federal government we are working with um, Senator Schumer's office on following in the Senate. Then at the state level, there's also a lot of legislation. And uh, we're talking to Senator Lanza's office and Senator Savino's office and Senator McCusick's office about which of those pieces of legislation needs support. And we'll, out we'll outreach to you because without a lot of people behind legislation, they often don't get passed, right? So it really does require you. And that's why I'm really, really so grateful that you're here tonight. Thank you.